there we go. Um, so yes, as I said, um, today is Marketing Cloud Connect, um, and the plan for us um, is to cover some of the key uh, functionality around Marketing Cloud Connect and what you might be expected to uh, perform in terms of tasks um, if you are working with a connected accounts. Um, the process of configuring is a separate uh, flow, and uh, one of the things I want to share with you is our official guide at the moment, um, unfortunately, still refers to configuration with Salesforce Classic. Uh, I do have a guide that walks you through configuration of the connector with Salesforce Lightning Experience, so you don't have to switch into Classic UI. You can, you know, pure play, navigate through the Lightning and do exact all things configuration market connected. That's one good thing. Um, I'll give you a um, link to that to these instructions, but practically just want to talk a little bit about data uh, synchronization, talk about the Salesforce events and activities within the journey, and then um, some of the functions that we do use for, um, uh, for specific use cases when it comes down to uh, connected accounts, because um, they are quite, quite important in my opinion. Um, and in terms of task completion, uh, normally when, when you're required to work in the accounts where the integration needs to take place, um, it is an expectation, number one, is you configure and test the configuration uh, of Marketing Cloud Connect. So Connector itself um, is a managed package within Salesforce CRM environment, and all Marketing Cloud editions are coming up with um, ability to configure that integration. There are different types of configuration. At, uh, at the start, by default, every single account allows you to configure to a single Salesforce CRM instance. And the connection is established at the enterprise business unit level. Therefore, when you're operating at the child business unit level, sometimes you might not even see the option to do the configuration because it's sort of done already for you um, and it's pre-configured. And that's one of the reasons why today we're not necessarily going through the configuration steps. So it, you know, it's done once and it kind of like every single child business unit is inheriting that. There configure we refer to as a multi-org feature um, that is enabled upon request uh, for customers and that feature allows to connect multiple CRM instances to a single marketing cloud account. So the connection is established at the business unit level. So in my example, um, I had a practical experience business unit. I can connect it to maybe my personal sandbox that, that I'm working with. Then my production business unit will be different and will be connected to a different instance. It could be production, could be developer, could be um, a sandbox as well. So there's ways to configure it in the different um, in the different options. Again, all of that is um, kind of neat. Deeper, deeper. Do you have a work with interest potentially you can spend a bit of time on. It's a separate track for um, doing that. The second element of what you expect it to do is configure the journeys that are initiated through the Salesforce CRM data events. And what I mean by that is the beauty um, of um, connected experience and connected account is that you can use a Marketing Cloud Journey Builder and instead of working with the data extensions directly, you can actually configure the events uh, that listening for record creations in Salesforce CRM. And then through the flow within the CRM, we effectively make an API call to initiate the journey. Great experience, real time. Um, there is no kind of technical work involved with that. Um, all you need to do is set up the wizard, like go through the wizard, set up the activity experience, and it's kind of done and functional. Um, really good abstraction from the technical standpoint of view um, and provides ease of use um, as well as that ability, as I said, in real time to respond to the events within the Salesforce CRM. Um, the other side of that experience is you've got activities within the journey builder that allow us to communicate or interact back with Salesforce CRM. Um, an example, you can create the task again, so we can add um, a contact or an opportunity and whatnot and effectively, um, you know, propagate back some of the uh, data elements um, to um, successfully sort of integrate within the Salesforce CRM flows or, or like what I mean flow is more like a business experience business flow so if you've got the opportunity management cycle if you've got case management cycle uh, we can augment the native Salesforce CRM uh, workflows with um, and I'm trying not to use a term that is specific for Salesforce CRM and keep using that so if you if you've got the process that has been sort of managed within the CRM 
him, like a case management, right? So if someone is raising the case, then uh, support analyst is assigned to that. Uh, then there are some activities and so forth. What we can do is we can connect that experience into marketing cloud and add additional communications around the case. Um, at the time when it's open, at the time when the maybe status change, when it's progressing through the um, you know, through the life cycle, um, and and it really gets that branded experience in the communication standpoint of view. So all the communications are managed within Marketing Cloud, while um, they are connected to the events that are happening within the Salesforce CRM. And at the same time, when maybe some of the activities happening on the Marketing Cloud. continue in the process on this year and there is that uh, component of that. Um, another very important piece is ability to synchronize data from Salesforce CRM into Marketing Cloud. So we do have within the Contact Builder, I will demonstrate to you a synchronization area where you can choose objects from Salesforce CRM and then pull them into Marketing Cloud. Uh, fantastic experience. Again, no coding involved. You really go through the wizard style approach, um, choose the fields, choose the objects, um, set the cadence, and then the system takes care of all the updates for you. And the great thing is we um, utilizing um, certain APIs that are not um, um, daily allocated Salesforce CRM. So it's a great experience for someone to say, I want to bring my Salesforce CRM data to extend the customer profile and understand a bit better when it comes down to the decisions within the journeys or when it comes down to personalization. Um, and in addition to that, we can use that for segmentation, of course, and targeting. Um, extra elements that I do have here, um, extending landing pages. Um, an example could be, and something that I'm hoping to quickly demonstrate today is if we want people to, for example, sign up for a newsletter. Um, so we can essentially collect the data through landing page um, and then utilizing functions within script directly create presentables for CRM. And the flow kind of builds us ability to say we can collect data, capture it, push it into Salesforce CRM in real time. That can then subsequently trigger the journey. But instead of going directly through the journey builder, we kind of take in the Salesforce CRM route and it helps us because the data governance is still in place. We're kind of centralizing all of our data activities through CRM and CRM becomes de facto database of records for us. Um, it is important to know when we're coming down to the connection is that we um, we enforce the use of Salesforce CRM records ID for leads and contacts. So when you start to who do we get into the journey, as an example, it always have to be selected as a contact user or lead uh, because we ultimately need to get down to either lead or contact as a sending entity. And the last bit, um, I think I did mention that, so using data for segmentation and personalization, we do have the synchronized data extensions. We can use SQL query activities with them. We can use MScript to access them, and then we can start building some additional segments. Quite often, the ask could be that we, you know, why would you do that if you've got um, ability to create reports, campaigns, maybe target these ways, uh, but you do need to come up with some audience use cases. Uh, not come up. Do often see that customers coming up with almost like a uh, bulk sense, like a audience um, sort of segmentation, and then some of the data is available available in CRM only, while additional attributes could be available in Marketing Cloud. Um, this way, when we synchronize the data into Marketing Cloud, we can combine through SQL activities both Salesforce um, data extensions um, that are created for us, as well as Marketing Cloud data extensions, and ultimately tie them together to define audiences and define attributes that we need to pull together. So these are the um, these are the key use cases. Um, as I said, the plan for us to go, I'll show you quickly the data synchronization, uh, configuration of the data event um, and activity within the journey, uh, potentially create the landing page that does the registration of the contact, um, just more probably from the perspective of giving you some of the preview of these M3 functions. And then depending on time, if we're going to go to um, this lower here, then um, I will just give you um, all the guides anyway, and you would be able to go through that. The key points is just going to give you uh, a bit of a walkthrough. So with that, um, let me pause the sharing. So pause that, um, switch to a different screen and walk you through um, <clears throat> what we're going to be. And we want to be on that screen. Here we go. Fantastic. And uh, as usual, as we go along um, through the um, through.
through the uh, session, just feel free to pop up your questions uh, either through Q&A or through the chat. Uh, Q&A could be a bit more preferable, just easier to navigate them and see which ones are responded and which ones are not. So anyway, um, we are in Marketing Cloud. I'm using a slightly different um, different instance in this case in, of my business units. And the key point for me is just to, in terms of integration, um, I just want to kind of quickly demonstrate you. So if you're working on the account that's supposed to be integrated, um, you should be able to see those features in the um, in the setup. Um, so you should be able to see that Salesforce integration is done and configured. So when you get into setup, you navigate into the platform tools, you look at the Salesforce integration option, it should tell you that this particular business unit is connected to a Salesforce CRM instance. Um, it tells me that it's not the sandbox because it's not checked. Um, scope by user is another thing. Sometimes um, I like it's rare these days, but you might have a configuration where things don't seem to quite work the right way, the data seems to be quite limiting. Just verify one of the things to say, this should not be used. Uh, without getting into details, um, it's a very rare use case where we would use the scope by user today. Um, it was a better sort of used feature in the past uh, with some of the changes in functionality and integration, it just becomes less and less common. So that's something to keep in mind if it's selected uh, and you're having some troubles, one of the ways to troubleshoot is potentially untick the checkbox and see if that fixes the problem. It will tell you what user is connected. That is important. This is the username from the CRM, meaning that we're consuming one of the CRM licenses for connectivity, right? And therefore, permissions, user profile, are all are taking place uh, in terms of limiting my ability to perform tasks. So while a connector can try to initiate an API call, a data pool, if on CRM side I'm not configured in, with appropriate permissions, then some features of the connector might not work. And then you've got this connection status, which is, um, I haven't actually seen any other statuses here. So that's thing number one. As I said, we're gonna go through configuration of the contact. Um, so I'm gonna go into the contact builder um, and we're gonna go through sync canonizing um, data from Salesforce CRM. One thing to be very mindful of today is, and it's kind of like, unfortunately, it's a bit more obvious um, when it comes down to that. Uh, when you go into the uh, configuration, it kind of applies to both um, events within the journey builder, as well as um, data that we're synchronizing from Salesforce CRM. We are utilizing Salesforce API and the version of the connector that the, the Salesforce API version that's supported by connector is a bit old and Unfortunately, it is generous to even say that today. Uh, we are quite behind. So some of the more common objects natively, things like loyalty cloud um, objects, or even um, what do you call it? Uh, profile and preference, um, you know, GDPR, um, like all, all of the individual and so forth, like some of these extra newer objects that we've added uh, to ensure that we're providing governance around permissions, preferences, and so forth. These are not visible to the connector because we are on the version that is behind. Um, therefore, be mindful when it comes down, when you start working on the account and you need to synchronize something, um, then you might actually not see it in the list of available objects. So in my case, um, you can see that I've got four objects currently already pre-synchronized um, and more uh, for the point to say, the connector will enforce certain data integrity, meaning that when I start with my configuration, I have to start with some of the sort of core foundational objects. Um, when I do the setup, all I need to do is click, as I mentioned before, um, to configure an entity. I'll just do the example. Uh, there is not much of the uh, difference right now in terms of what we're doing. And when I start looking into the list of different objects that are available to me, as I said, there's plenty of entities um, that the, the platform can see. But if I come across and if it's a first time synchronization, then most of these would not be available for me to get synchronized. And you will see that there is a pre-requirement to say maybe synchronize an account and or contact and or lead and or user and whatnot. So therefore, we kind of forcing some of these relationships, um, which is a great thing because it sort of um, ensures that we've got some sort of level of data integrity in place. Um, I can navigate through that and I can say I need accounts, I need to look into the users, I need to look into, I don't know, um, net, uh, really put poor choice, um, user. So um, it does sort of do a bit of a search for me. So I can look, as I said, different options, um, and 
maybe for example in my case I want to start looking into account being the object that I want to work with synchronization so I choose the the object that is the entity and then the system will kind of put me into the next step which is in essence configuration of what fields do I need to bring from the object now some of the things to keep in mind we selecting up to 250 fields from the entity that we need to synchronize which should be more than plenty because one key thing about any work that you do in, in the account it's similar to the data extensions the fact that you can bring a lot doesn't mean that you should bring a lot so we need to be understanding what data do we bring and why is it required in marketing cloud the system as you can see and that's a really good example because it does enforce data integrity from the perspective of choosing ids for me there is no way for me to pull that up without getting the parent id owner id and so forth um, this is sort of maintaining that integrity and connections and relationship of the configuration so I can say, all right, I'm curious to get the description. I'm curious to get the name and account number. Um, and maybe, I don't know, maybe let's pull up the type. Um, I'll click next. Um, the system will tell me, so how often would you like me to collect the records? Um, and, and are there any limitations that you want to imply? So in this case, because it's an account, I can say all or I can say all records created since a particular time. You can see that the third option, which is currently disabled in, in this particular use case, and it's mainly because it's not a sendable entity, which means not the lead, not the contact, not the user. If it would be, I can actually say, well, I don't want contacts that do not have an email address in synchronization because I don't really need them as I can't do anything for these people. So that could be one of the factors. The other side, I can nominate any Boolean field on the or checkbox type in the uh, CRM to be serviced as the flag to say, do I synchronize that to Marketing Cloud or not? Um, it is convenient and quite often I would encourage to think through um, if you do have different conditions, multiple criteria that can change over the time, create a formula field that encapsulates all the business logic within CRM. And then here in Marketing Cloud, you choose that formula field to kind of indicate you whether or not, um, you know, it needs to be true or false and whatnot. Uh, be mindful that Formula fields may not always trigger the change, but anyway, that's kind of like behind the scenes. So, and then pulse, pulse schedule itself, you know, from 15 minutes to, to one hour. Um, very common question, how often do we do that? And um, how, you know, how true it is. So if you're looking into synchronizing 100 million records, um, that will definitely take few attempts for us to pull. Um, and even 15 minutes interval may not actually hold true because we, we kind of get batches we can synchronize records and then some of them will come later down the track so it's more of how often the, the system will do the polling um, and effectively look into changes on crm site um, pull them through um, through api and, and kind of bring them here we are making use of replication api so if you are familiar with the force.com um, side of things um, there's a flag for the objects and one of the other limiting factors to support um, the synchronization is that the object have to be um, having that replicate property is replicatable or something like that set to true so then it, it becomes available and therefore when we're utilizing that uh, replication API it will do the change and it's very well documented how it's identified so if you ever curious about how do we pick that up uh, CRM side of things um, check out the documentation the replication API is a go-to library tells you and gives you all the great story how it sort of all works together Practically, um, I do normally look at that and say, most of the time people tend to choose 15 minutes, which is fine. But if you can look into some of the data doesn't need to come more often, then you can go up and say one hour. Because remember behind the scenes, every single operation that we do is kind of running up on the same database. So if you have a lot of entities, if you're doing unnecessary data, sort of synchronization processing, it does put a bit of an extra constraint on the database. So be mindful with that. I mean, it's a not a huge difference, but nonetheless, if you've got, you know, like me, 140 entities today here, they want to synchronize 50, it may not be a big problem. If you're talking about the big account with, I don't know, 50 business units, um, then all of a sudden that completely changes the game. And, um, you know, when we go into the uh, multiple business units, you'd need to know that the data model is actually replicated across all business units. So synchronizing in one place, it kind of shows the exact same data extension across other um, other places. So it does take a bit of time. And, you know, if you do really need it 15 minutes, that's great. If not, stick it to one hour, more than fine, save and synchronize. 
So I'll start doing that. Um, and actually, I'll just change that to be all records. I don't need to filter it. So I'll do that um, and I will start OK. And the system will start doing the platforming. So it will effectively um, look into synchronizing, pulling it and populating that. Um, it started, but it's not yet complete. Um, it may take a, a bit of time or a lot of time, depends on how big the object. If you're doing synchronization for the very first time, especially on the projects where you need to migrate data, if you need to do the initial data load, please, 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 one of the mistakes we did, in my experience, was we, you know, we defined with the customer's go live date and forgot with the fact that it actually takes a fair bit of time for us to do the sync. Um, I think on the non-sendable objects, there is one volume on lead contact um, and user is a different volume because once we synchronize these, we actually count them towards the contact utilization on the account. Um, and what it means is there's extra processing happening behind the scenes. So ultimately, in my case, we effectively had to respond uh, the go live for two days simply because when on the evening of the day before go live, we decided to go and do a full synchronization. We didn't even check the database of the customer and realize that there's way too much data for the system to essentially pull it all up in one go. And it took us like a day and a half to, to actually get that all through. So after that, I'm going to just make sure that you understand if there is, if we're talking about, you know, large volumes, meaning more than a thousand records um, or 10,000 records or maybe 50,000 records, then you do want to account for the fact that it might take a bit of time uh, to get the synchronization done. Once the first cut is done, usually it becomes less of a hurdle. Um, you don't need to worry about um, that going forward. Now, the only other thing that you need to be mindful of. So when the synchronization happens is um, you can see that our configuration is done. And unlike in Automation Studio, all of the things that are happening here, they are available in that activity view. So changes to the configuration, the actual process when, you know, started, when it's completed and whatnot. Um, so, you know, synchronization started uh, and so forth. There is no notification like in Automation Studio to say it's completed or it's aired out. So from time to time as an admin, it is important to come here and just look at the activity log, you know, check every single entity, make sure that they all are green, they all display synchronized um, and that everything sort of keeps happening for you as you go. That's very, very important because if, if, if it happens that something doesn't quite work, then, you know, you need to kind of go and fix it up. Now, the other side is um, quite often, you might find yourself that we've configured synchronization. We go, ah, we need another couple of fields. As I'm just displaying you, clicking on the button, uh, sorry, on the entity itself, I can go up and configure um, any additional fields that I need. So you've got them required and optional. I can click on the edit button. Um, in my case, this is a case object. So I'd say maybe, um, I don't know, didn't, didn't include the description. So I'll just add the description here, click save. Um, and the system will take care of adding that field for me into the view and it will update and refresh the cadence and so forth. Again, similar um, at the at the object level, I can actually see at the activity, um, you know, here on the object itself, like what are the changes and, and how it works. If you need to pause synchronization for any reason, you can, you can click pause. Um, if you need to do full kind of reset, resync, there is that mini little button here um, that allows us to kind of reset the configuration of the object altogether and repo it um, entirely. So that's configuration for you. So you can see that the system is doing updates of the fields and then we'll start doing the pull and effectively bring up that um, update of the record into, um, into Marketing Cloud. What is important is um, when when I'm configuring, especially for multi-business units, another thing to say, you can see that account and it has a name account underscore Salesforce underscore 401. These numbers, they're different and they represent the, the notion of me being in the enterprise account, having multiple business units and a lot of other business units before me have configured synchronization for case, contact, lead and account and so forth. And the system just simply increments numbers. They're not always the same. So that's another thing to, to kind of work and be aware of. Why is that important? Imagine you start sending an email and you want to pull information from one of these data extensions with Mscript. If you reference the data extension, you need to ensure that you're correct, correctly selecting which data extension you refer to, because otherwise um, you might get into the wrong place or the system will tell you that it cannot see that data extension. So if the account is 401, it doesn't mean that the case is 401 doesn't mean that contact and lead are the same, right? So 
that's a very good indication that you actually need to be mindful of that and verify specifically what is the name of underlying data extension that is created for you great thing is it's done for you so you don't have to worry about that um, and all the updates and plug into the um, contact model which is another great thing is is done for you so you can see that um, it refers to my configuration I've got 63 attributes here may or may not have incremented with the fact that I've just added another field and object but you can see that all my dot extensions or entities that I synchronized are now connected they are represented you can see that Salesforce lead and user ID here and the contact ID here, they all are sort of represented as being part of the um, contact framework and how all the different data extensions relate to each other, all right? Like case, account, account, and so forth, because they're like cross references. It's not two different data extensions, it just indicates that the case has a reference to the account and then contact has a reference to account. So all of that is just more understanding the model. You cannot modify that. You don't need to modify that try not to attempt to modify that uh, but what is important though when you start planning your decisions when you start planning your data retrieval it is important to understand if you communicating for example in my case with the lead ID um, and then is opposite to the contact ID you can see that the model may be slightly changes it may not be the same but it may not be different right well in this case contact doesn't have a lead relationship necessarily exposed here if I looked at the lead lead has a reference to the contact so when you start making a decision it is important to understand how the system will go and traverse this this layer and I think I was talking to if you need to connect more than three tiers of the data extension in the contact model you might need to ask yourself whether or not it is the right data model and approach for that with Salesforce CRM unfortunately there is no enforcement there is no way for us to minimize that it's just whatever is system treats it comes and exposes that but the other side of that, it could be that you might find sometimes the relationship is done in such a way that it's not how you want to traverse the data. And in these cases, you might actually need to create a query activity that will copy the data from that connected data extension into normal standard data extensions. So you create almost like a copy of that. Um, and with you know connecting that new data extension as additional data source will allow you to kind of traverse the path in the way that you want it to be. Um, it's odd use cases, but they're still important to understand. The big thing is to keep in mind, you cannot change that relationship. Whatever is configured through the connector is done for you. And all you need to do is just review and ensure that whatever the traversal is done is done correctly for you when you're configuring journeys. Um, that's, that's all that it comes down to data synchronization. So understand that A, you might not see all the objects, B, configuration that is available is done within the contact builder. There is no notifications. It's a passive view of what's happening and if everything is healthy. So as an admin, have a task to come here once, I don't know, in the blue moon, once in a month, once in a week, in a fortnight, depending on the customer needs, or at least instruct them to come here and just do a bit of a check to make sure that this is all good and, and works fine. Important to have that in place um, and inform the customers about that too. All right, while we're switching gears, any questions um, on that particular topic, Shibu? Anything that's worth um, answering right now? Um, none that came up yet, um, but I mean, there was a, one or two questions, but uh, one of the things that I answered was like, you know, if you do a delete on the uh, CRM side, it doesn't mm -hmm. uh, reflect on the SMC side, like we have to manually go and delete the record, right? Um, no, it, it does support the deletion of the record. Just remember that CRM delete is a soft delete for, I believe, 14 days. That's why my CRM knowledge can be tested and checked. Um, so until the actual record deletion happens, we, we will flag it as deleted, is deleted. And um, after that, we will delete delete once the actual delete happens on the CRM side. So the sync so we, we, carries, we should be doing carries that over? Yeah, sync does carries it over. And one of the common questions that we do have is specifically around contacts and leads when you're synchronizing them. And sometimes you do need a cleanup of the um, of the contacts database. Like it could be old contacts, someone you know requested to like through GDPR, like request to say, can you delete my data? Um, and you're kind of going through, all right, so I need to come and delete them in Marketing Cloud. And it is important not to actually start with Marketing Cloud in these cases. You go into CRM, you delete the contact, um, and then once the contact delete propagates into Marketing Cloud, then you delete them in 
see like in marketing cloud through the delete process so the system will take care of deleting them from that context underscore salesforce data extension for you but they're not going to be deleted from all subscribers all contacts and whatnot so that's one extra thing that is kind of like you need to take care of that uh, but you only start with that from crm side you don't start with marketing outside if you do start with marketing cloud side you'll find yourself and there's a help article or knowledge base article around that to say um, the system will kind of do the next sync and even if you deleted it from these and whatnot what you kind of told marketing cloud that now it needs to start abstracting that data and scraping it out so you will find yourself all of a sudden you've got contacts that have like a hash key instead of having crm record id or any other key um, and that's one of the reasons. So it's more deleting them on marketing cloud side first without waiting for the CRM sync to be propagated and, and wiped off um, in, CRM, in marketing cloud. So it's, it's, a good, it's a good point, yeah, to, to cover. And um, here we're looking to two things. So number one was I wanted to discuss the event configuration. Um, and number two, so hold on, just making sure that I've got this message that connection drops off. So if it does go poorly, please let me know. So in, entry sources, remember we, we talked about that extensions and different API events and whatnot. Our interest here right now lays down with Salesforce data. So when, when you kind of pull that particular event itself, uh, there are a few options that you can choose from. I, ignore this one because that's something that I configured previously. But in our case, you've got three different options when you start. The campaign great, um, is a great starting point if you need to look into use cases where you know, someone is joining a campaign. So you add someone as a campaign member. Um, great feature if you have more than one campaign potentially. So I can go up and look and say, okay, I want to have a user conference. I want to have um, you know, international electricians, uh, trade show and whatnot. So I can look and say, whenever customer joins that particular campaign, um, or one of these campaigns that I've just selected, um, I can then define what particular data do I need to bring with me. So again, look at that ability for the platform to take care of the key critical elements that I will need within the journey. Number one is it pulls up the campaign member ID. So it provides me cross-reference to other data points. Um, number two is it does identify if you pushing contact ID or contact elite as a campaign member, it will distinguish between them and pull up the right ID. So it knows which particular identifier it needs to work with. If your lead is converted, then we're gonna inject contact. If, if it's a net new lead, then it's gonna become a lead ID. So therefore this journey can, can cater for both leads and contacts at the same time. It does pull the email and it does pull the email opt-out flags. These are all standard flags though. So make sure that you do understand that. These are the standard fields and then standard email addresses that we're using um, then in addition to that you can start looking into relational data that is linked to the campaign member object again in this particular view the list of objects is limited to what the connector can see through the api right so when we're looking into all of these relationship i can say well you know i might need to pull maybe a campaign name um do need to have a name so I'll pull the name here. Um, I might need to put uh, what date. I can't remember what it was like. Let's say the end date. Maybe I want to just check that and start date. So I can and I can pull from different objects, um, and then like system will start populating this view for me. So any other things that I need to pull from here, whether it's a, a, another object, I can build it up. And then when I go to the next step, it effectively says, okay, this is what's gonna happen. So we've got contact elite that's gonna be added to this journey. Um, we're gonna look at the campaign member object in Salesforce CRM. And the criteria is ID, you've got two campaigns. So I've, I've selected two campaigns. If the member becomes, like if the individual becomes a member of one of these campaigns, we will get them into the journey. And here's a list of all the data that's gonna be pushed into Marketing Cloud for me. So fantastic, um, all done as I said before, through the wizard style approach, there's absolutely no code involved. A few things to keep in mind. As I mentioned, may or may not have mentioned, for every activity, everything that we do in Marketing Cloud, we need to have a correspondent data extension. The system will create one for me. It will reflect the journey name and the timestamp at the back of that. It will be sitting at the top level data extension folder. 
But what's interesting and what's important to keep in mind is when we're pulling that information, it will have a different notation to what you may have been used to by now with me being, you know, like nicely laying out with spaces, uppercase, lowercase is easy to read. So I find personally, I find this is non-marketing friendly. Um, it's really well oriented for developers who can read it. As a marketer, I'm struggling with that. Um, and therefore, I, I kind of encourage to always be mindful of these. The other reason for why to be mindful of that is um, when creative team builds up the content and you've seen it, we build up these personalization variable placeholders, right? So we can start making the message to be relevant for an individual. Um, when we're using field names or putting placeholders, we, some, we refer to some notion of the data model. Um, it may or may not be obvious for the creative person to really understand where a particular attribute will come from and what data type it is and so forth. So it's kind of gets down to you being as a technical implementation person, you need to ensure that you get the journey specifically with Salesforce data. You kind of need to work with someone who's working with creative side of things to ensure that all the personalization and dynamic content configuration is done correctly. Quite often, this is another point when we configure dynamic content. It would be nice to have ability to configure dynamic content using Salesforce data model, but we can't do that. So we need to come here or create an event, done, save it, and then the system will create the data extension for us. And only then we can go up and configure these dynamic content blocks within the journey. So again, it's another point to say the workflow and the process of when you start with event data versus with the creative content or how do you mix and mash them together is super important when it comes down to these connected um, account use cases. So it's a, it's a pretty much as I said, forced, uh, forced feature for me. All right, so campaigns are done. Uh, second bit is we can look into Salesforce community welcome. So it is um, when someone, like it's a, again, another use case that is right for us. Um, you look into the communities. I think it's gonna last me to say, cause I don't have one. I think, yeah, I don't have that. So I won't be able to demonstrate to you, but nonetheless, uh, basically, we're saying for uh, similar workflow, you're going to go through and say when someone joins a community, we can get them a communication right out of the gate, uh, which is a great use case. Again, abstracted flow and simplified flow, because we know the use case is someone joins the community, want to greet them. We can certainly do that. The one big thing I want to highlight straight away, um, the specifically Salesforce campaign, due to the con high contention on the campaign member object in Salesforce CRM, please try to avoid using that as a source for the high throughput journeys or the ones that do have potential for the high throughput. Meaning that if you've got, for example, like more a B2C oriented transactions, a lot of people can be added into the campaigns. There's a lot of these campaigns happening that can potentially create contention on the CRM side with the injecting flow of people into journeys. You get to the point where events are happening in CRM, but we're not getting all of them propagated fast enough um, and all of them into marketing cloud and therefore that creates a challenge. The workaround for this case is usually involves creating custom object which sort of works as a junction object. It's a simple get my contact ID, campaign ID and whatnot. You're almost creating your own custom campaign member kind of thing and then that is serving as a trigger for the journey. And that takes me to that Salesforce event, which is a bit more junior. So when you start with that, uh, we support standard and custom objects, again, down to a certain level of API version that we do. You find an object that you want to work with, and maybe I'll do the account as an example here. So I'll find that system will ask me which account do you want to use, person account or, um, you know, business account if you've got person account enabled. In my case, I'm just a plain account, so there is no person account enabled. It will ask me to choose who do I want to target. So you can see that it forces me to go through one of the users. Not necessarily that. Let's just look into maybe um, opportunity rather. So I'll go in the opportunity. Again, it will kind of force me to do that. And for some reason, I'm just not getting luck. So let's do the other case, more standard. More standard object. And again, goes back, oh yeah, there we go. So we've got contact ID. So that, that's one of the things that I was trying to, to demonstrate. So you've got contact ID um, that tells me, yeah, I can choose the contact or I can choose user, or if I go into find campaign member, I can go and choose the lead. So essentially I choose, I wanna get the contact. This is who is gonna be traveling through the journey. So the, what contact key we're gonna pass to the journey builder through the data extension. 
that will identify the individual. Okay, so that's the setup that is done, which object triggers that, and then who do we inject in? Now, you've got an option to choose at the time of creation of the record in CRM, as well as update. So you can both, or one or the other. And I might say when the contact is created, and if I want to do some filtering, I can actually filter it on CRM side. So that entry criteria, think of that is, it's almost like a process builder conditions that's gonna be going up within CRM. And if I'm not gonna meet the criteria, then the contact is not gonna be passed to a marketing cloud at all, even if the record is created, okay? So it's kind of like a nice way to um, kind of limit down who needs to be pushed into marketing cloud for further, further decisions. Um, the limit is here only the CRM data that you can use to make these decisions. So in my case, I would go and say, well, I'm kind of choose the contact is created when the case is um, created, right? So when the case is created, meet specific criteria and I say case, maybe let's source. Uh, if I find a source, uh, case origin, a really good idea. So if I drag that um, case origin here, actually I could not drag it. Okay, I can do both. Fantastic. Um, and case origin, one interesting thing you can see that the great value of the connector, it does recognize pick lists option. So I don't have to type that. It actually pulls them out and does the selection for me. If I refer to things like campaign ID, it will actually let me search for a particular ID if I want to limit by campaign. Now I'd say if the case origin is a web, all right, so it's similar to what we used to configure in the journey building the decisions. And then maybe case reason, which should be a bit more um, interesting. Well, let's say breakdown, like, okay, let's, um, let's choose that. So both of these options selected. See, if the case is not web and not the breakdown as the reason, this case will not trigger anything into marketing cloud. All right, so we know that this is web and the breakdown. Now, the next one is I have a filter criteria that I can use for additional objects that are linked to the case. So the first one was case, but then if I need to use anything else, because the entry was at the case level, I can still do, um, you know, account, asset, contacts, so or whatever my schema is, and I can say, well, maybe I want to choose specific accounts. And then bring up the information to say, all right, so at this case, I need to pull maybe case number. Um, I want a case uh, reason not. Maybe I want to have a case type. Uh, what is the description? Um, and then anything else that I'm, I'm going to bring up. Parent case ID if I need to, so maybe name. Um, and is created if we've got this meeting criteria and then these are the details that I'm going to be pulling from the Salesforce CRM into um, into the event so I'm click done I do want to save that and you will see that the name and everything is here so if I want to do that and say okay case web and then I put what did I say breakdown case creation Breakdown. All right, so I'll save that. Um, if I'm going to navigate into uh, my content builder, just open a new tab, um, then you will see that um, it creates the data extension for me. As I mentioned, with all of these different properties, the fields, everything, um, everything is kind of taken care of. Um, so we'll we'll have a look into that. Now, the flow, as you've seen, it's pure play wizard. So there is no technical. Um, complications involved we're kind of lead, letting users to go and configure it um, and it's a great as I said great experience to kind of consider because um, you're looking into that triggers in real time as, as close as it gets and it's really an abstraction through API so we you know pulling the records the trigger happens in CRM we go through the flow it will propagate the event through REST API into journey builder and we're pretty much pushing up all the information that we need to do if you need to reconfigure it, um, reconfigure different fields and whatnot, um, then um, I think some of the attempts were manually go and update the flow in, in CRM as well as update the data extension. Honestly, I didn't went like I didn't go myself through that um, thoroughly enough ever. 
and usually if I need to recreate it I'll just delete the event and configure the new one so that's um, just something to be mindful of it's not as easy as just adding the field in the D uh, or going up and hacking the CRM side of things um, it, it's actually is a bit more complicated than that um, for some so kind of keep in mind that once you configure that it's pretty much if you need to extend and change that particular flow you will have to come and reconfigure that entire um, that entire um, uh, event itself now we looked into that case creation wave breakdown so that's the dot extension that was configured um, you can see that it just pretty much reflects the journey and then I've got the timestamp here um, that appended to the name which is um, good so I can easily find that after it's created, even though it sits at the top level data extension folder, um, I do have a habit of creating a subfolder for all of the CRM events and I just move them around. So I can easily move that. There's no problem with that because system will still find it and recognize that. And then the other point, as I mentioned before, um, just looking into these um, field names. Okay, so the system does the type recognition for me. It does the naming um, sort of enforce for me. And therefore, if you've got accounts where the marketers would be using data from CRM as well as data from within Marketing Cloud that can create confusion. So please be mindful of that and kind of try to educate the end user or if you're an end user, just be mindful of that and, and work, um, as I said, once the data is sort of ready and good to go, then you work with the content as a final line to align the personalization and dynamic content resources. Because even now, once that data can actually go and configure that using all of these fields um, and attributes and write personalization the way I need to. But again, just kind of re reminding you that the data typing, the length of the field, nullable and whatnot, it's all enforced. I have no say in kind of coming here and doing that. Um, and you should not need to have a need to come and, and modify that manually. All right. So rely on the fact that if it's done through connector, leave it for the connector to take care of and, and work through that. Um, these data points will be available through the journey. So if we want to bring uh, for example, um, it's jumping up a bit here, so hold on. If I want to bring the what are called decisions fleet here, um, you know, maybe make maybe make some decisions. Uh, we can look into path um, path flow. So while it's loads up, uh, we still see that journey data is a part of that uh, workflow, and we would be able to choose um, you know any field within that um, that extension itself. So I can bring up and use any of these elements. Um, into criteria and the great thing is so think about that we use real-time data from Salesforce CRM all right so as you've seen when I went through the steps there is absolutely no relationship to data that is currently in marketing cloud and it could be the case that case it's almost like um, no pun intended thing here so it, it could be the chance that the case was created but it might have not been synchronized just yet into the contact data here so I can come here look in these case data extension if I did synchronize that it might not even exist here right so that that's another element to kind of be mindful of has nothing to do with that we're triggering through real time it's coming up from Salesforce CRM and the data is provided as a part of the payload that's been pushed into that event so it's currently separate from what is in the um, contact data that is important distinction because the case what you would see is the, the journey data as you should know by now is not um, is immutable, meaning that if you bring the case here and the status would be open or new or whatever, um, it's never going to change in the journey data, even if you change it in the data extension. But in the contact data, if you go into the case, then that will change throughout the life cycle. So once we've got the cases here, uh, once it's sort of all functional and easy and available here, let me see, that's a case feedback. Um, so I'm just curious why my case object didn't didn't show up here and maybe because I was hacking it through um, and it's not available just yet so anyway once the cases are here um, you know I can look into like relationship and actually say okay my status was open the case number is that is it now closed is it now result so I can still make decisions using the data that is in here in marketing cloud um, and that's another another important distinction once we do the event entry the real-time connection with CRM is over now, from that point onwards, anything you do within the journey in terms of consuming data is looking into synchronized data extensions. Okay, so we're not looking into CRM anymore in real time. It's always about using what you have configured in Marketing Cloud from that point onwards. So that's another big thing to, to be mindful of. All right, moving on to the activities that are Salesforce activities. So we spoke about messages and all the other things. The key points for us are 
Customer updates. This customer update, the update contact, is only, as you've seen, updating data in Marketing Cloud Data Extension. Okay, it does not make any changes to the data in CRM. It only links and looks at the data extensions in Marketing Cloud. So that's something to be very, very mindful of. If you do need to make any updates into CRM, you need to work with these nine items, nine activities. So how we've structured them, you've got ability to create, uh, to work with, let's say, task, opportunity, lead, contact case, campaign member, and account as sort of wrappers around standard objects or the ones that we choose to be standard. I work with task as an example. I can bring it here, right? And I can say, what do I do with the task? You can create a task, you can update the task. So you've got different options to work through. As any, any CRM um, activity that you have to configure, you need to say, well, what do you do with that particular object in CRM? So you can create a new record or you can find and update um, a record in the CRM and then perform particular action. So you're going to go and say, okay, which particular um, activity ID you might look for, or you might choose to say, what that activity ID has to correspond to a specific item. So you kind of need to figure out, okay, what do I need to have in my case, maybe when I push the data in which particular ID so that can I then update corresponding entities and whatnot. So that's again, another things to kind of be mindful. Of. Um, just giving you an example. And then if you know what happens if you do find matching or if you don't find the matching records, what if you find more than one and if you don't find them, like do nothing, create a new and so forth. So it's almost like the conversation here is, Create, up, update, or observe kind of thing. So if I choose create, plain view, plain view create, um, again, it will tell me the recommended fields and then give me the optional fields to configure. So I might say, you know, name ID, I can create a subject. Um, and a great thing here, I can populate some of the elements pulling the data from Marketing Cloud. So, and I can use, again, I can use the, um, the case number, so, you know, maybe I just want to use case number and you can see the system will populate it in the right way. Um, or I can go up and look into potentially uh, providing a hard coded value. So, you know, I can just say um, subject could be um, additional activity for my case. <coughs> and there are ways to work and merge. Um, you've got the name. So again, you can see like if I'm looking for a specific reference, a lot of the times connect gives me ability to do a bit of lookups, <coughs> apologies, um, and, and find corresponding IDs for me. Um, I can assign <coughs> to an individual in the journey or I can choose an ID from the journey event data. So it could be a case contact ID or if I pull the owner ID, I can choose whichever particular things I need to do. Um, so let's say contact ID for, for just the sake of completion. <clears throat> and then I put in the description. So again, you, you can, as you can see, you can, you've got the plenty of different, um, different options. You might look into priority. One of the other things I wanted to demonstrate, again, it recognizes pick list um, and therefore I don't have to type. It just kind of helps me to maintain my data clean. So I can go and say, well, it's a high priority task, click save, done, whatever. So I've got these few things configured. I click next um, and all the system does is I can say, okay, um, in the case task for the contact, follow up on something. Um, this activity is going to be on the journey canvas, so you will see it in a minute. So I've got this, this configuration, it shows me highlight, great, done, <clears throat> and I've got it configured. So the name of the activity that I just typed comes here on the canvas so I can see what I do. Um, if I need to look into what is actually happening, um, again, I can see it um, when I click through the um, through the activity and actually see all of these results. Um, so that's task. Um, again, it, it does kind of show me like what the pre-configurations are done. When I click done and it's pretty much uh, good to go. If I need to work with activities other than these, like other these standard ones, um, I've got the object activity, which is our unique, uh, sorry, not unique, uh, more like generic option. So the very uh, big difference between this activity and the previous one is when I start, it will first tell me which object do you want to work with? And I kind of have to go and say, well, all right, so maybe I want to create a 
I don't know, case, um, comment, fantastic. So I'll go and create next. Then I want to go and create new contact, new comment, uh, fantastic. Um, the parent ID, I can choose the data that comes up. Um, maybe I just choose my case ID that comes from the journey. And I don't know why it doesn't select here this way. I, I did, didn't, just didn't really show. And then, you know, published on the published in body so we'll say boom this comment arriving from marketing cloud again i can use some of the um, data points from within the um, contact model and training data and i can say yeah i want to publish that so it's going to become available so configuration is done click next um, same story if i didn't put anything it will just create case comment activity so it's optional, I can rename that if I need to, but that's pretty much done. So this configuration is active, and now when I reach that point, it will create the um, action for me in, in CRM, and um, everything works nicely from that uh, point. I don't have to go and uh, do anything. The last bit I wanted to demonstrate to you, there is a late conversion activity, uh, which is, while available here, practically, um, you should restrain from using that. Um, there are different reasons behind that. Um, it's the you know the, the the play between marketing cloud contact key what happens if you've got the lead coming up through the journey and then they convert to become a contact um, marketing cloud will have to create records but it sort of all becomes quite messy and therefore um, while it is here it's again one of those cases where it, it had had a bit of a thinking and vision for it it's potentially less applicable these days uh, for a number of reasons. So before jumping into that, just one thing and a word of wisdom is to say, please verify with um, your design team in terms of why are we doing it here versus doing it within the CRM uh, as an example. So it does allow you to configure normal standard lead conversion process. Um, you can choose what, happen, what happens with different fields and whatnot, how do you migrate stuff and so forth, but um, it's all CRM content. Nothing happens in Marketing Cloud. Uh, we practically still maintain the reference to the lead ID and then by the time the contact arrives we're going to start swapping and playing with them so it, it really gets a bit messy from perspective of managing that um, as you go along. Okay, um, that is uh, really it from the journey point of view and the data point of view, right? So we covered the activities, uh, we covered the event, um, a great thing to think about CRM, so one of the use cases uh, in the journey that I will link for you as a task or we'll go through the configuration task maybe. Um, it's optional really, but more from the experience, if you do want to experience that is, uh, one of the requirements could be you want to notify multiple people about, um, you know, about something. So an example could be we've got a case, we need to escalate it, we need to inform, um, you know, a, a case owner, manager and whatnot. Uh, or we want to have like um, inform the, the, the member of the store where the customer made the purchase, but the customer is going through the journey. So in journey, when you get an individual inside that experience, when someone is going through the canvas, there is only a single individual, right? The contact key that we have. So all the activities that you perform, all of these messaging activities that we execute, they always targeted to that contact key. With the CRM activities, one of the great creative ways to think through is you can actually, um, you know, add person to maybe another campaign um, as a campaign member, or you can create a comment or task on the CRM record or add another record of, of a different type um, to essentially initiate another process. So it does require you to know a bit of a, you know, the processes within the CRM space. But the great thing is from here, you can actually trigger, like notify maybe a manager of the case owner, like how would you do it within Marketing Cloud? Well, it's a bit challenging because you kind of need to trigger a different journey, figure out who that manager is, pull the data in and then send in the email. Well, here you just create a case or follow up or reminder or like whatever, uh, comment on the case, tag the, the right individual there and then they will be informed. So that, that's a great way of kind of like aligning and informing multiple people. Um, and then potentially when you create another case, you can actually trigger another journey from this journey uh, but, you know, it, it's almost like it, it's different, different experience altogether. One thing to keep in mind when you're configuring these and other journeys is the scope, right? So scope of the journey has to be directly related to the event that triggers that. So don't try to create very excessive experiences. There are long ones. 
with a lot of activities, A, practically be hard to maintain, B, they become um, hard to translate even to like what actually happens, why and so forth. So it, it's nice to have, if you've got, you know, the case in this example, um, the journey for the case should not live longer than the case life cycle. And at some point in time, you know, it, it kind of should exhort all the potential options of what you can do physically with, within the journey communications. So kind of making sure that um, you understand all of these um, elements when you're designing these. The rest of the stuff is just kind of keeping in mind that you will be limited to who you inject. So common question is, I've got the custom object. Uh, I want to add uh, the record from that custom object into the journey. That's never going to happen. So the system will always enforce you to use contact lead or user as your target individual. If you do need to come across that customization options, then you'll have to do normal SQL query activities or filter activities from synchronized data extensions create your own data extension as an audience and inject them as the marketing cloud data, not the Salesforce data. So that's um, another thing to be mindful of. Uh, you always get that sort of limitation enforced on you by the platform. And this is more to ensure that when we actually do send these messages, specifically emails, um, the connector will synchronize the behavior of the events, like open email send, email open, click on the link um, and, un and unsubscribe and whatnot into Salesforce CRM. So that it's something kind of, you know, it's a good feature of the connector. Um, and if you're not going to use, um, you know, contact lead or user ID, then this functionality won't be available to us. Um, another use case where it's commonly sort of, you know, not necessarily a custom object, but it could be like a person account. So we want to inject the person account. Again, if you're doing segmentation in marketing cloud, especially with queries, it is common for um, for a person who is configuring that to make a mistake to actually use um, account ID, person account ID. So marketing cloud will treat it as a new identifier. It's not connected to anything else. It will create a new contact. So it's contact utilization and then no synchronization from the tracking standpoint of view. You can still use an account ID to link to the other data points, but again, Practically, what would be a better option is to actually use the contact that is linked to that person account as your um, contact key to inject into the journey. All right, that is another story that is done. So we covered, I think, three items out of the four that I intended to go. And then the last bit that I wanted to cover are the landing pages and M script functions. Um, while I get to that, um, Shibu, any questions that might be worthwhile looking at right now? Don't rely. I think for now. Okay, we're good. Fantastic. So let me just come up with this um, with this example. I did have that form sitting down here somewhere. <clears throat> so one of the uh, reasons I do bring it up because it's a convenient feature uh, for us to go and say, well, um, we've got different events and we want. Um, so let me just save that and close. Um, I'll configure that later. So we, we want to, um, to configure um, a particular behavior or we've got, sorry, a campaign. We want to configure like a data collection on data updates, or it could even be related to the custom preference centers where you do need to pull the data in real time from Salesforce CRM as well as um, write data back into Salesforce CRM in real time. And um, Mscript provides the ability to do it even within the emails, which is absolutely not recommended way of doing that, but nonetheless, it is still feasible. It's just more, um, you know, something that is there, um, we can do, and you just need to think through why you're doing that before uh, jumping into that and doing that. So CRM, Mscript, um, let's call it Mscript, oops. Um, let's call it this way. So I'll create the collection. You are familiar with that. We've done it um, last time. And within that uh, collection, I'll just create a landing page. Um, and what we're going to do is uh, we're going to check in the court. So what we'll do a use case could be a customer want to embed the form that uh, provides a registration for uh, a newsletter um, on the site. And it's uh, not necessarily an un, um, un, you know, like uncommon experience. So we'll do news news there registration for uh, content builder I go here 
and we're going to create a blank entry point here. So I'll get a bit of a code uh, and let me just publish that up. So we'll do HTML block. And I do have that piece of um, piece of information here. Let's see if that works all correctly nicely. All right, um, it kind of does, uh, which is good. Um, so I've got this, ignore the fact that it's NTO references, doesn't really matter. Uh, basically, similar to the last time, remember when we looked into the landing pages, um, I left out the placeholder, so I'll just um, leave it as a hash so it can submit to itself. Um, the rest of the stuff is uh, very much um, sort of what I want it to be. So we want to say the customers want to sign up, we've got the first name, we've got the last name, and we want to get an email address. Um, may or may not be all of that relevant, but nonetheless it gives us the toggle that gives us ability to check if this is, um, you know, if the customer is opting in. That's great. Um, so what we want to look into is publishing that. And I'll create a similar processing page for us um, to kind of quickly give you a bit of a demonstration to that. So let me just go and say, go to the screen. So this was more just giving an idea of what we're trying to capture. And then the second one is going to be newsletter creation processing page. Okay. Similar story. And I'll just copy the results. Uh, so I've got a bit of a placeholder here to work through. Let's see how that plays up with us. Uh, all right, so normally uh, we would want to look into, let me just do, I think it's just one of those things where the comments are really handy. All right, um, the result is just an indication, right? So we're gonna do something, and basically what I've done is I've, I've sort of put together a bit of a uh, pseudocode to say what it would do. And normally how it looks like is um, you've got initialization of the variables with the form fields. Um, you check if all the mandatory fields have been provided. Then you wanna look into existing uh, record in CRM, and if the record is not found, create new, set appropriate result message, and if the record is found, update it and set appropriate result message. If not um, all mandatory fields applied, then you want to display an error kind of thing. So that's the logic behind all of that. Um, and the most um, sort of important thing to look here is just how do we actually get that done? So a few, few things to be aware of. Um, for us, we're kind of collecting that. Um, you are familiar with the request parameters function, which is great. Um, the important bit that we want to look for is the retrieve Salesforce object function. So I'm just trying to hit the link um, and demonstrate to you um, here. So let me just jump in. What does it bring to us? Um, it is uh, an ability for us to look up the records in Salesforce CRM in real time. So we've got an example here, very simple. Um, you're looking into an object um, where um, identified by an ID um, you know, oh, sorry, the fields that you want to bring up. So ID, first name, last name, where the region equals West, right? So that, that's kind of like the, the SQL query that's sort of been built up. Um, what you will find is that we can create multiple conditions. Uh, you've got different options to use equals or greater than, less than and whatnot. The, the, the one thing to be mindful of when we're building that uh, criteria, so you've got the values, um, you know, you've got three different options they always group with and criteria. So if you need to bring up, you know, and and or, like you kind of need to be mindful that maybe you need to run a couple of queries in the result set. Um, it is very important to ensure that you do sort of limit up your result sets altogether. Um, you know, kind of try not to do a bulk retrieve uh, because the key point here is these operations that we do on the landing pages, they are going through the API and they are, um, counted towards the governor limit. So it's not a limit of the how many API calls you can do on a daily basis or 24 hour rolling period. Uh, it's not counted towards that API. It's just we can get to the point where we can exhaust the governor, essentially saying 
if there is too many people registering for the newsletter at any point in time, maybe like, you know, 200,000 for some reason decided to go more relevant for the campaigns, like we're, we're going to go and launch the new product. We've got the page, people registering, they get the ticket, they get promotion and whatnot, and then it goes boom. Uh, there's an error because we can't, we exhausted the governor limit, so we can't create any more records because the sort of API is too hot. Um, not very cool. So more thinking about these should be considerations that you need to uh, apply with the CRM side of things knowledge and knowing that even though we don't count to the daily quarter for the API calls, we're still subject to the governor limits. So that's one thing to know. And because we're doing retrieves and updates and creates, um, there could be multiple operations. So if you think about concurrency and potential throughput, then all of a sudden that can possess a bit of a challenge. So that's the retrieve. If you want to look into create and update, there are two functions. One of them is create Salesforce objects. So if you're just doing plain create, uh, pretty straightforward. It creates uh, a record. You define what particular record you want to push. So you say, I want to create the lead. Um, then you decide um, how many fields do you want to populate. So you got two fields and you're going to say um, name, value, name, value, pair. Right. So that's as easy as that. So we're creating a contact, sorry, lead with first name Chris, last name Chris. Um, as easy as that. And then another function that we're doing is update single um, record. So you can get sort of similar to retrieve, but you're kind of going up and says, well, I need lead update with this particular ID and you're setting an email address equal that. So you can update pretty much any other object in the exact same way. Um, so that hopefully gives you a bit of an idea and I'm not going to necessarily pull up and go through building up the, the code itself for the page. Uh, it is something that I will um, leave you as a bit of a challenge um, is one of the things because I want to pause in about five minutes and kind of open up a bit more um, for Q&A. But before I do that, um, so I wanted to bring up one pager. Just give me one second. I'm just going to bring that page into the picture. All right, so I believe Shibu shared that um, link in the Zoom meeting notes and everything. So we've got uh, quite a few updates um, added to the guide. Um, apologies, I did sort of try to do it early in the week, but that didn't happen. So, uh, but at least they are here now. So you've got uh, most of the course in place. Um, Shibu is helping me with these, uh, one of the activities. So we'll have that uh, for you later on today. The rest of the stuff is here. So you've got content configuration for like emails, landing pages set up, the journey configuration that we've done with scripting um, and APIs. And then for today, I'll link a couple of, um, couple of activities for you, um, just mainly configure and connect it through Lightning experience, because um, I think it's good to have that at least as an alternative than switching into classic, um, as well as a um, couple of setup options. So you can actually go and practice if, if you do get a chance to do that. Um, now, on this side of that, and I probably want to maybe um, let um, um, Shibu to kind of talk about how and why, but practically we've got few ideas uh, for those who do get a chance to follow that and build it in the, um, in the Marketing Cloud accounts to look into some of the capstone projects. Um, doesn't have to be all of them, could be one of few, but you know, if you want to extend and practice your um, sort of learnings uh, after this today's session, um, then these are just some ideas that you can extend and, and look for. And I think uh, the reason I said I don't necessarily want to build up the whole page here because this is just one of these things uh, specifically for that scenario one um, is how do you configure some of these workflows uh, for uh, for the context. Shibu, do you want to touch base on, on that a bit more? Yeah, or? yeah. That, that'd be great. Um, so team um, and, and for folks who probably will be watching the recording later as well, like, you know, uh, we want you guys to like look at all the sessions that we had in the past with the four sessions as well as this one um, and see like if you can actually do an actual hands on on some of these areas. Um, and then if you can submit that to us, um, we will, um, I will send out an email as well after this uh, with the uh, with our contact IDs. Uh, we do have some certification vouchers that we want to like you know, uh, you know provide to you guys like you know based on uh, who we can complete the exercises and, and send across like first come first serve right um so we would definitely would love to like you know see your um, you know hands-on experience and then and, and any issues that you faced any feedback uh, definitely welcome and you know how we can help you guys go forward okay sounds good all right well as i promised it's a bit earlier today but 
just want to give a bit of a chance to go through questions if there are any questions and this is really any sort of type it has to be doesn't have to be only for today it could be any session within the course uh, let's let's have a bit of a discussion um, anything we've got from anyone so far I'm just trying to get to the Q&A and chat it's a bit difficult when you are presenting in zoom this extra windows just pop up and disappear uh, Vlad, uh, do you have an email ID that, that I can keep copied on this one? Do you want the Salesforce one or? Yeah, yeah, this Salesforce one should be fine. Absolutely. Now, do, do you see any questions by any chance from anyone? Um, no, nothing new has popped up in the Q&A window. So team, if you have any questions, please do go ahead and you can start putting that up in the Q&A window. Um, and then we can, uh, Vlad definitely would be like glad to like take a look at it. Absolutely. And, and not just for this session, like you know, if you have any questions in general regarding Marketing Cloud, anything that's of interest, like please do. This is a good opportunity like to go in and clarify that. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm happy to try and challenge myself. It's almost like we need a bit of a drum music. Yeah, you probably had one like, you know, when you started before the session. Yeah, background. Right. Something like a bit of a background. Hold on, let me see if I can get that going. Whoops, that worked. All right. All right, I'm just going to keep it quietly in the background. Um, yeah, if, if there are any questions, if there are any comments, um, let's go us here. All right, first game through. So where we can see automation log details, it is pos is it possible to see stepwise log? Um, good question. Um, one challenge that um, you can uh, get with the Automation Studio itself is, well, it's not necessarily a challenge, but as much information as you can pull out of that is going to be limited to um, what you can see in that activity. So when you go into the automation program, if you look into the activity step behind uh, at the very last Step. Um, this is where all the you know all the available details that you can find. So remember when we we're talking about configuration of the import activities, uh, one of the things that um, we we're suggesting was um, to ensure. Let me just see. Last modify. Last modify. I don't think I've run them, but let's try that. Um, configure the notification email to be sent uh, to you as well, because if there are no activities, like that's really the only place where you can see the logs. So let me just run down to I don't know, 1st of April, still nothing. I might have not even run that program for a while. So let's do that, April, select. Uh, let's change that, okay. Still nothing. Yeah, so that's really the only place where you can see that. Um, and it's not going to give you necessarily step by step as a log. You will see that you know, green activities versus green, 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 red. Or you might get around to see green, green, and orange activity. Um, if we do have a skip, if you've got verification activity that says, you know, maybe the import didn't bring up any records and we paused and skipped the run of the program, this will be reflected. But that's as much as you can see today. Um, there is no any other way to get and extract the logs uh, within within Marketing Cloud. It's a good question, Sadhana, um, because it, it is common to ask. I'm finding sometimes puzzled myself, where do I find logs in the CSLs for CRM? Um, but I kind of look into it. It's the same, like in Marketing Cloud, there's not much you can see from the processing. And, you know, as we discussed today, synchronization of data is, an, is another good example where I would prefer to have more ability to be notified from the platform. Uh, versus doing a passive log of what is actually happening. It does provide better insight into some of the changes in activities, but not to the, um, you know, still not available in automated fashion. Sure. Um, 
any other thoughts on anyone from anyone on the call? So let's do questions here. Don't Wanted, I think there's someone who raised a hand. Let me see if I can find that somewhere. I love to talk. Hey, hello, Samir. Can you hear us? So if you if you raise the hand. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Samia, you, uh, you kind of raised your hand, so do you have a question for Lad? Uh, really, actually, I want to know about the activities you were saying. Yep. The activities, like uh, we are explaining about the different activities you could uh, do. Mm -hmm. So, can you just repeat that? Um, activities in Journey Builder? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, so, let me get a quick jump into that activity so let's get there <clears throat> so basically when you when it comes down to the activities right and I'm assuming that you want me to confirm the Salesforce CRM activities um, and if not feel free to, to let us know so when you start working with a journey builder and you work with salesforce activities um, you've got quite a few options to work with uh, because we're providing you access to some of the standard uh, sort of objects and behaviors um, so which one was that i created okay so there's a version this one that went right down so i'll take this as an example <clears throat> so when you look in the standard set so you've got um, objects like task opportunity lead contact case campaign member and account so they are standard objects and what you can do with them is you you've got you know multiple options um, in terms of creating a record you can update the record um, you can create a task or you can try to do find and update so kind of like absurd activity basically if i look at the contact um, as an example and good use case could be you might get the contact coming into the journey because the case was created something through the case um, sort of de defined to the point of saying hey we, we've actually um, you know responded to you the customer came back provided clarification and we want to update the flag maybe they um, you know they need to be carefully handled and whatnot so we, we can uh, in this case do the update we can even say simple update because I know that we inject in contact uh, so the person who is in marketing cloud, uh, which is correct ID for this uh, for this particular activity. So I'll do that and let me just bounce here, click next. Um, when I'm configuring what what do I actually do? So the way the system does is first is you define the action to create the record, do you update the record, do the simple update like in this case, and then I choose what particular fields do I want to populate and update. So maybe um, you know I want to change the first name. Maybe I want to update the flag that whether or not they are an MTO member, and I can say, yeah, that particular um, you know, field needs to flag and say they um, they are an MTO member because they became a member, a part of the program, um, and so forth. So that's one way of looking into what these different activities do. Um, the other side is more geared towards um, some sort of workflow during scenario. So example, I was going through the case task or um, an opportunity task, um, you know, I can create case comment, right? So these activities are, um, if, if they're not selected natively through one of these predefined use cases, you go and create the object activity. Um, and when you configure it, you need to nominate which particular object you wanna be work with in Salesforce CRM. And then you define very much the same, what actions do you wanna perform? So as you can see, um, I was referring to, it does look into objects supported through the API. Um, you know, maybe I need to create another case. Maybe I need to add a case comment. Uh, maybe I need to, I don't know, contract request submission and so forth. So I can start configuring all of these items. Uh, and then again, going into that, do I create a new item or do I find and update the object? So once I go through that, create a new one, 
um, I'm effectively asked to populate fields that I need to be populating and the system will take care of the process for me. So hopefully, um, so hopefully that helps some of you and if not, feel free to add additional questions and we can refine them for you. Um, Thank you. Sure. Um, all right, there was Abhishek asked, why do we need to establish one-to-one -one between sales and marketing cloud users while setting up marketing cloud connect? Um, well, it, there's a few sort of points to look at. Number one, um, you have configuration. So marketing cloud connect works as a, um, as a, as a package. Um, and basically it is a software that is doing an API integration between marketing cloud and Salesforce CRM. So in order for us to be able to access both marketing cloud and Salesforce CRM, we need to configure a user permissions, right? Or a user license. One has to be on marketing cloud. So when the connector interacts with, um, you know, with marketing cloud, it, it needs to kind of know on behalf of which user would do that. And at this point in time, even though uh, we're doing auth authentication and whatnot, we're still tying it up to the user license. We're not configuring, you know, like an API connection like we did in the last session. So it's not that integration that we're configuring. And the reason for that is just how it works. That's just natively how Connector has been built. Um, may or may not change in the future, just more like know that this is how it works today. Same applies on the CRM side. So when you're configuring the CRM side, you need to say on behalf of which user that connection needs to work. But when you're configuring that, you kind of configure it on from marketing cloud side. So as I demonstrated at the start of the call, when I go into my business unit settings, I can see within Salesforce integration, which user is used for because connector and CRM side initiates conversation with marketing cloud, right? That's a one way direction. Then from marketing cloud, we need to talk back to the connector, but in order for us to establish that connection, we need to have a corresponding CRM user. And that's why we're connecting business unit to that CRM user. Um, that's connecting the products together. You've got another option to look at is whether or not your user has to have a license connected both on marketing cloud as well as CRM. If your marketing cloud user need to be configuring certain activities and you don't have a CRM integrated user, so your marketing cloud user license is not connected to CRM user license, then technically you are not allowed to do any actions on CRM side. And therefore, in some cases, you will see where connector still sort of becomes like a proxy and conveys the message that this user is trying to do a particular action. The CRM system will respond to you and tell you, well, you're not allowed to do that. Um, and vice versa, if you are a CRM user trying to use some of the marketing cloud activities through some of the um, layout buttons and whatnot, then they will have to go and kind of be, you know, delegated to marketing cloud to gain conversation flows and marketing cloud says, well, hold on a second, that particular CRM user doesn't have a marketing cloud license. So therefore he or she should not be using um, that functionality and it, it will raise an error. So you, you kind of have like two layers. One is connecting the products together. And then second one is connecting the user users together. Um, the next question from Abhishek as well is, do you always use CRM ID to map the user between marketing cloud and CRM in this case? Um, well, practically the way that if you look at the, uh, whether you look at the trail or the guide that will walk you through configuration, um, you will see that it will kind of treat the user that you're currently being logged in or you will have to log in as that user. So we, we look at the, yes, I guess it's the ID of the user that we are connected to. You will see it in marketing cloud um, and in CRM, it's um, sometimes a bit more difficult to actually see which particular user license that given user is linked to. But yeah, it's always related back to a user um, ID. All right, hopefully that helps. I'm just trying to see if there's anything else in the chat that's popped up. Details we asked. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, my pleasure, Abhishek. Okay. Okay, there was a question from Sanjana, I think. Um, when we use customer updates to update the data, does it update CRM data too? Um, 
very good question. So I'm glad that you're asking that. So if you look into this customer updates update contact, uh, when I'm configuring this activity, you will see that it only configures the updates within marketing cloud. And I did sort of highlight that and I'm happy to repeat that because it is a good point and I'm glad that you're asking that uh, because I'd rather you know that for sure. So I can choose a particular uh, data extension. Let me just see if there is anything I can pop up here. Just choose that maybe. Come on. Oh, yeah, there we go. Something was coming up. So let me just choose, say, customer 333. Um, so I can choose the data extension, and you will see that in this configuration, I can only work with the attributes within this data extension. And what it means is when I update and set the values in this data extension, there is absolutely no relationship, no propagation, no updates to CRM side of things. If you need to do updates in both places, it is important that you do this contact update activity as well as potentially using that contact item, right? The, um, the action which is really working with CRM objects. And, and they're good points because they only work on one side of the connection. The Salesforce CRM activities, they work with CRM side of things. The marketing cloud activities, which are all about, they work with marketing cloud side of things. Uh, so it's a good distinction to make and good distinction to have uh, when you're configuring them. So this update will update records in CRM only. And the only sort of extension of that would be if your contact is synchronized to marketing cloud through synchronized data extensions, then once we update it in CRM, after the synchronization runs next time, it should bring these updates into marketing cloud. So you will eventually see them. But if you need to update in any other data extension, that is something that you'll have to do manually. So um, that hopefully helps as well. So, John. Let me describe the changes here. These are good questions. Um, so I'm glad that you're asking them. So one other thing, uh, Vlad, probably we can mention as well. I don't probably know if you already have the CRM instance open or not. Uh, but if you have like uh, a sales cloud user um, mm -hmm. and they don't have like marketing cloud and um, login, mm -hmm. they can still, and if the connector is set up, they can still, um, you know, send a marketing cloud email through the marketing cloud uh, connector app, uh, the package app that's built on uh, on the CRM side, right? So we have the XI target, the old XI target, the, the, the interface that comes up on the on, on CRM side, uh, where they can actually trigger to a report or a campaign. Um, and then send across, the, I mean, you can see the, the emails that you've configured in a marketing cloud on the CRM side and they can send it out. Um, yeah, so I, it's, it's actually a good point that you raised because I, I believe what actually happens is we're not allowing for that to happen. So if I looked into, hold on, give me a second here. I'll double up the, I get that out before it happens. Oop, resume share, sorry. Let me just go back into this, I think. The dialogue, so I want to go email. I'm pretty sure this is. Uh, it'll be marketing cloud, like uh, marketing cloud uh, brings yeah. up the connector. Yeah. yeah, I was trying to think if it will get me to the um, send definition, then I can go from there. If not, we'll go back here. So this is where I was talking about the user connectivity on both sides. It doesn't really look right. What well, brings me to the wrong place? All right. So um, let's see. Yeah, that should bring us up uh, to the right flow. So A is not the um, lightning experience, therefore it should bring up into the different UI. Um, and then um, you know, I think I got something blocking up my pop-ups. So bear with me, because uh, I need to almost like undo this tab. Gosh, one of those times when having things uh, control things at the top doesn't quite help. So let me just say continue blocking, always allow, click done, and I'll do this and see if that actually works. 
because it should be. Yep, the, the switchboard. So um, one of the configurations I was referring to before is you're connecting the platforms, but the other side is that particular activity will actually ask you for a user license. So the first time when you access that email, um, and you will see it will do exactly that because my user is not integrated in this case, right? It will ask me to say, you need to connect to the marketing cloud as a user. So my license in CRM right now is not connected to a marketing cloud license. And therefore, if I will proceed, it will establish that link. But if not, it will tell me, well, you can't actually access that interface. So that that's what I was referring to before. I think Abhishek was asking is that one-to-one -one connectivity is done in multiple places because you need to have a license to connect platforms together. And then for every user who will be, or who is intending to use marketing cloud features in CRM, whether it's through that interface or even if you go into the page layouts and you can click the button, send an email, or I think it's a link, um, as well as like trigger the unsubscribe or change of the subscription status. These features require license to be installed. So you can see them, you can get to that point, but in order for you to proceed further, it will actually ask you to log in into Marketing Cloud. So if, uh, if I click connect, it will now look into, okay, my logged in session, it will pull up the details and it will kind of establish the connectivity for my user. Uh, but if not, it will tell me, it will come up with a login window and tell me, you know, what, what, what's your login. So I don't think the way you're explaining that is gonna work. So it will force you to have that license connected. Got it, got it. So basically you're saying like anybody from the CRM side, if you want to send a mail in Marketing Cloud, you have to have that one-on-one -on -one connection, right? Correct, okay. yes, yeah, yeah. And that, that's really one of the good distinctions because it may not always be sort of understandable uh, when and how it sort of plays, uh, but yeah, well, once you start actually practically going through that, you see that. So it's um, <clears throat> one of the discussions in the course that we have for Marketing Cloud Connect, we discuss, you know, it, it's good practice to have a separate user license for connecting the products together. So it's purely from Marketing Cloud to CRM and from CRM to Marketing Cloud. So that's one user license on both sides that is not used by actual users. And then for every other user who needs to be accessing features from one side or the other side, I mean, if it's a CRM user, who needs to be using Marketing Cloud and Marketing Cloud who needs to be using CRM features, they have to have a corresponding licenses in both places. Um, and, and that sometimes becomes a point of contention in discussions because the customers might not realize that they didn't buy an extra license. And then they sort of say, can we connect with Salesforce administrator or someone who is a user, which is absolutely doable. So it's not a mandatory requirement, but it kind of puts that at risk that if the user then moves on from organization, someone disables them on CRM side, it kind of holds up the whole connection. And once the connection is broken, reestablishing connection resets the whole work that you have done before, which is um, significantly more challenging to resolve. So more being mindful of that. Um, but that's why we kind of say, like have a separate clean license for just connecting products. Um, ask for account executive to give a discount if it needs to be. And then for every user, that's a fair ask because if they're using Marketing Cloud features, they have to be having a license in Marketing Cloud. Um, and I believe this is less of a problem these days. It's just more the license on the CRM side that is kind of giving us the cost griefs. Uh, but again, for most of the people, if you think about that, journey builder connectivity is done through the connector. It's the configuration. So if your user is not connected, you come into the journey builder, you see these activities, you drag them on the canvas, you try to configure, the system will tell you, sorry, you're not connected, like it will give you an error. And it basically because you don't have a corresponding user in CRM. And when we're trying to access objects, when we're trying to look at the data, um, the CRM will reject us uh, from doing that. So that's really where it sort of fits into. Thanks, Vlad. Sure. Um, and that's really, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. It's a tricky question and um, usually um, kind of gets tripped over if you're kind of unfamiliar with that. Um, Priyanka asked a good question is, how do you enable a journey builder in Salesforce? Um, I'd love to be able to answer that there is that feature that you can enable it, but practically it's a marketing cloud uh, product. So um, you need to understand that we have two separate platform life, like platform licenses. One is for marketing cloud and the other one is for Salesforce CRM. They're not one and the same. And therefore, everything that we did in Marketing Cloud requires you to have a Marketing Cloud license. It's not something that you enable in Salesforce CRM, uh, unfortunately. Um, okay. Let me just check if there is any other questions came up. No. I'm glad you guys are asking. These are good questions and I'm 
please continue asking them. Uh, we still have about 15 minutes to go until the end of today. Um, if there's anything else that sort of is a bit of a, a doubt or concern or um, something wasn't clear, I'd be happy to, um, to, to help. <coughs> So while we're waiting for some questions, I'm going to go and quickly have a sneak peek. So if, if anyone wants to ask a question, please do. Otherwise, I'm just going to quickly check on what happened with my case status because I was surprised that it didn't pop up in one of the um, in one of the screens. <coughs> I'm curious, uh, what did I do with my synchronization? I thought it should be functional, but OK, five entities. Case is now synchronized. I think I was trying to create or something and didn't didn't show me. No. <coughs> all right. Um, yeah, it seems to be all functional. Case management. See. So if there are no further questions, um, I'll probably just reiterate once again. So um, do do remember to bookmark that um, course guide because we do want you to be able to refer to that at any point in time. Um, you'll see that Chibu kindly shared the recording playlist, so I've added that to that uh, to that document as well, so you can conveniently find everything in one single place. <clears throat> um, don't have to go through multiple um, multiple links. If you bookmark that, you should be able to do that. Uh, we'll get you the data management piece that is missing today, like the, some of the guides, um, so you, you kind of can follow the activities to set up the import activities and FTP. Um, and then for um, for this CRM, I'll, as I said, I'll put the guide for connecting with um, uh, with Lightning Experience versus going up through um, <clears throat> through the classic, and then a couple of exercises for you to go through. Priyanka was kind enough to ask another question. What are the similarities between Journey Builder and Automation Studio? Uh, yeah, really good question. Uh, I like that. Um, so, if you if you think about like similarities, both of them are marketing automation tools, meaning that uh, both orchestrate and execute a certain processes. Um, you can see that both of them use drag and drop interface. Um, they kind of canvas driven so you've got the workflow that starts on the left and goes through the canvas um, and navigates to the right um, the difference straight away comes up is what each of them does so if you think about the um, journey builder itself is a very contact or customer centric uh, workflow it, meaning that we take an individual even if you get multiple people into these experiences uh, we take an individual and kind of put them through a particular experience that is represented on the canvas, which is a journey itself, right? So we can uh, send an outbound communications using varieties of channels. We can make some decisions. We can have a wait activities that allow us to sit and wait for a certain behavior before we continue through the workflow. Uh, the automation studio is similar in that sense, but it, it is usually geared towards more um, back of the house processing. So things like importing data, things like transforming the data with theory activities. Um, you can still execute some of the send activities in Automation Studio, but they're not as visually uh, you know, appropriate. And then most of the time they're batch driven. So it's something that we're trying to move away from. Because um, if you remember when you start with a journey, you can create that um, a single sort of experience activities when you execute it once, so single send journeys. Um, and the other reason that we, we're creating them is just it helps us to later in the future potentially move away from <coughs> having automation activities, automation studio activities that execute that. So if you need to have a single send journey, you kind of need to think about automation studio as the place where you prepare the data, where you execute certain actions behind the scenes that then used to power up the journeys but like that that's a good way of thinking through that so you kind of first step is almost like well i've got 
some data, maybe on FTP or with a new release that's coming up, uh, which is going to bring us the ability to connect to S3 directly, which is awesome and fantastic. So you can bring the data into Marketing Cloud. You can, you know, massage it a little bit with queries. You can segment it out, uh, and then you need to start effectively executing some activities to communicate and engage customers. And at that point in time, you hand it over to Journey Builder, and then Journey Builder becomes the tool where you visually orchestrate what are these detailed experiences would look like. Um, that's the good way to think about that because there are, there are a few overlapping features, but you know you don't want, you don't need to go into the sort of detailed level of like well I can do it here and there where I do do that. If you if your mind is always set to do prepare do the back office activities in Automation Studio and then orchestrate and manage customer experience and journey builder, then it helps to to kind of differentiate between them and and use in a better way that is a bit more uh, sort of feature proofing and forward coming. Um, if that makes sense. I love this question though, it's a, it's a good one. Something um, handy to, to know if you are preparing for any of the certifications exam as well. You need to have a distinction between the products and understand what they do and what they don't do. Um, all right, so that's a good start, good end. Um, one of the things I wanted to say uh, before anything else, um, just want to, uh, you know, express my gratitude to all of you for participating in these experiences, uh, joining up with, you know, today's session only or some of the sessions or even all of the sessions. I'm really grateful for having that opportunity to talk to you, to share some of the knowledge. Um, I do hope that it was practically useful, uh, that you learned something. Um, doesn't have to be everything. If you learn at least something, it, it's already a step forward. And um, we would just encourage you to continue your learning. Um, don't lose the interest. Um, I found in my practical experience, a lot of people get excited about marketing uh, once they get a bit of a preview of that and a bit of a try. Um, it is different. It's not, um, you know, traditional developer-led experiences, but they are pretty cool and um, some great stuff that you can do with marketing. Um, it does require a bit of an analytical mindset, in my personal opinion. Uh, you get a chance to work with data, you get a chance to work with people, which is great um, because you kind of need to think about, you know, you being almost in the center of everything um, and, and relate to things that you build, relate to things that you create, um, look at the experiences that you can help uh, customers or your organizations to, um, you know, to manage through these different tools that we provide you and equip you with. So. Uh, these are great learnings, um, great tools, and yeah, I'm kind of like a big advocate for marketing because I think it's a great domain to be in. Very agile, always keeps you on the toes, um, constantly innovating, um, so there'll be plenty of things to learn. You'll never get tired. Um, and I don't know, Shibu, what, what's your point of view on that? Would you agree or disagree? Fully agree, uh, Vlad. Like, so, I mean, uh, I've been in the ecosystem for about like 12, 13 years, but uh, marketing only a couple of years. And I was like, before that was like a black box to me. And then all I knew was like, okay, I knew a few folks who were working in marketing. Once I started on it, I got hooked onto it fully. Like, and, uh, so whoever I meet right now and they say, okay, we want to learn marketing, join the team. Absolutely. That's great. And yeah, for those of you who, who do think um, about you know taking certification, if you um, if you're really keen on vouchers, I'm just going to scroll back. So these these are some ideas uh, what you can do. If you if you have any other ideas about you know where you want to take, and if you want to show and share with us your capstone project as we refer to, um, please do welcome. Um, and we're open to any options here. The, this is really more an opportunity for you to kind of put a bit more effort to think through to try a few things. Um, it does require a bit of a practical side of that because uh, we do want to be sort of um, respectful to those who do put the effort into um, into study and, and doing things. But hey, if you need help, if you need some support with that, um, then we can potentially consider helping you out as well. Um, I guess with that, I'm going to stop the recording, stop the sharing. Once again, thank you very much for being with us. appreciate everyone's today time because I know it's, as I said, like it's a public holiday in a lot of places. So... If it is in your case and um, you're on your day off and you're joining us, I'm really grateful. All the best in your learning of marketing and I look forward to welcoming you in some other sessions in the future. Um, and for Shibu, once again, thank you for um, in inviting me to participate and take that journey uh, with you together to kind of share up the knowledge and share up some wisdom here. Thank you very much, Vlad.
we couldn't have done this without you like you know so much knowledge that you have like you know very very happy that you will be able to share that with our community thank you my pleasure um thank you Priyanka as well for your um, for your kind comments um all right all the best um enjoy the rest of the afternoon and um your great weekend and i'll speak to you in the future goodbye thank you